We're just so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. And as always, this is the announcement time. First off, we want to point out there's a seminar coming up, How to Survive the Holidays. It's going to be a great seminar. And here's Pastor Adrian Presley to tell us more about it. Happy Sabbath, friends. We realize the holidays present a unique challenge to those grieving the death of a loved one. Bittersweet memories, loss of traditions, an empty seat at the table, feelings of loneliness and sadness. As a way to offer support, on Sunday, November 22nd, five days before Thanksgiving, the Loma Linda University Church will present an encouraging and supportive 90-minute virtual seminar on Zoom called Surviving the Holidays. During this seminar, you will learn practical holiday survival tips. Now, this may be exactly what you need or you may know someone who can be blessed by this. To register for this event, please go as quickly as possible to our website, lluc.org, and look for Featured Events on the homepage. We look forward to seeing you there. Also, a quick reminder, the Association of Adventist Women are continuing their Vespers program that they're providing us and we're making it available to you. You can go to their website or you can go to LOUC.org and you can see it this evening at 5 p.m. And then finally, it's November. It's hard to believe we're actually almost Thanksgiving, but many of you know that this is the time when we really put a focus on our U Ridge ministry. And as you might imagine, under the COVID circumstances, there's a lot of demand and need for what they're doing. This is the month we focus on raising a lot of the funds that they use to help people in our community. We want you to put on your calendar November 21, during a Sabbath school time, the music department and you reach have gotten together for a very special program. And we'll be giving you more information next week. Well, that's our announcements for today. As we've mentioned before, a lot of things are changing from week to week. We encourage you to go to our website, LOUC.org for the bulletin and other information. And with that, we hope you have a wonderful Sabbath day.
Happy Sabbath. We are members of the Loma Linda University Church Bereavement Team, and it is our privilege to help support families during their time of loss. In normal times, we provide a reception and fellowship after the service. We are aware that this pandemic has made it difficult for families to honor the lives of family members. Do know that our thoughts and prayers are with you daily. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I am so honored to be flanked by these wonderful ladies whose passion it is to be God's human vessels of comfort and encouragement to those who grieve. We have really missed being able to serve you in person, but we are confident that soon we will resume this important ministry in our church. We want you to remember that while we care for you deeply, no one cares for you like Jesus. And today, Pastor Randy will remind us of this as he takes us back to the precious cross of Calvary, where all of us were reconciled to God by his grace and forgiveness of our sin. Now, we who were once God's enemies are now his friends. We who were once condemned are now forgiven. We who were at war with God now have the peace that transcends all understanding. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to live reconciled lives. Now that's good news. Brothers and sisters, we're wishing each of you a happy Sabbath and welcome to worship.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come into your presence because you are so much holier than we are. And yet you invite us to come boldly before you. And so we come today, some of us are scared, some of us are frightened by things that are going on around us in the world, and we're frightened of the virus that's going around and people are dying. But Lord, we're thankful that you are in control of our lives, and we're thankful that we can come and praise you and thank you today. We also come with burdens on our hearts. There are people who are sorrowing, who are grieving. There are others who've learned of a bad diagnosis and the illness. And there are others who are have suffered loss, loss of a relationship or of a job. And we just pray for them and ask that you will be close to them. But Lord, we're thankful that in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our not trusting you, that you sent your son to die for us while we were yet sinners. That we didn't have to get our life all fixed up before you would accept us. And that we have already been reconciled with you and we're grateful for that we pray that you will be with pastor randy as he opens your word today open our hearts to receive the message that you have for us and lord we look forward to that day when jesus will come and most of all the best part will be seeing jesus face to face we long for that day because we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Can you believe it? It's November 7. It's fall time. We're in full-blown fall time. And here at Loma Linda University Church, we have a tradition. It's called the giving season. We've been doing this for many years. The giving season is marked by the months of November and December. And during this giving season, we raise money for the new building. You see, friends, we're on a major building campaign. We call it uh, We Build for His Kingdom. It's the Family Ministries building. And we have built this building to glorify the purpose of our Lord. And friends, every Sabbath during the giving season, you will be reminded of um, a very special Sabbath that's coming up, December 19, and of the giving season. We're giving it a name this year. It's called the Celebration Offering Campaign for the We Build program. Friends, the Celebration Offering is referring to the fact that we have finished the building it is complete. But friends, now we have to pay for it. So we want to give in the spirit of celebration to thank God for His goodness. And we just celebrate that it's finished. It's complete. We can't wait to get into it. But now we have to pay for it. And friends, during the giving season, you're invited to take part. I was looking in Luke regarding giving. And there's a fabulous scripture that uh, reminds me to check my heart. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38, it says, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you give will be the measure given to you. Friends, I want to invite you to consider a very special offering for December 19. As we, um, as we look at and try to be responsible with the debt for the new building. We ask that you will keep in mind our budget and the outreach programs that are here at the church. You have been so faithful. 
But during this giving season, we ask that you will consider a very special gift that we might be faithful and uh, accountable to the debt of our new family's ministry building. In the coming weeks, you're gonna hear more from Pastor Randy and myself about the condition of our debt and uh, a good report, uh, the state of the building report. And we look forward to that. We wanna say thank you for your faithfulness. You have been so faithful. And we ask that you will continue to bless this church with your offerings. Hi, my name is Vanessa. This is my friend Laya. And we're going to be singing Peace in Christ. And we hope you feel peace in your heart today. means boys and girls that means I get to do one of my favorite activities ever and that is I get to play you know once upon a time Mary was with the baby Jesus in Bethlehem and Joseph had gone to a fire truck because he was racing to get baby Jesus to the hospital wee, 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 wee. and just before Joseph got to the manger the wise men were coming in in a chopper to give Jesus all their presents and the wise men had also called the shepherds and so everybody was coming to see baby Jesus and then all of a sudden two pups from Paw Patrol came and started barking woof, 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 woof. and the reason they were barking is because they were scared you see the Riddler was gonna come and see baby Jesus but the Riddler was bringing T-Rex hmm. you know boys and girls it might seem kind of weird to have all these different toys but the reality is that in heaven, we are all going to be together, even though we're different. So rather, while maybe some of you are like T-Rex, really loud, 
And some of you are like the baby, really quiet. Heaven has a space for you. The Apostle Paul says that in Jesus, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, male or female, free or slave. We are all one. We are all the church. Huh. I think I should keep playing now. Oh no, T-Rex! Oh! What are you doing? Are you playing with my toys again? You are so busted. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, well, I, I guess I'll... Oh no. Oh! Good morning, church family. Today's scripture is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. And it reads... Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity, out of the two thus making peace, and in one body to the reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away, and peace to those who are near, for through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Our world is characterized by a history containing an unbroken stream of people who hate each other. People who hate each other so deeply that when one group is in power, they will damage and destroy and annihilate other groups if possible. It's an unbroken chain of hatred. Such was underlined some decades ago in a song sung by a group called the Kingston Trio. Some of you have been around the block enough times that, like me, you remember the words of the song. Some of them are these. They're rioting in Africa. They're starving in Spain. There's hurricanes in Florida, and Texas needs rain. The whole world is festering with unhappy souls. The French hate the Germans. The Germans hate the Poles. Italians hate Yugoslavs. South Africans hate the Dutch. And I don't like anybody very much. We'd be tempted to smile, maybe even laugh a bit, except that it hurts too much. Because the words of the song are true. We hate each other. Racism and bigotry, bigotry are rife, not only in our land, but on our globe. We face deep division, searing questions, scorching problems. And in the midst of it all is the church. Now, if you were to ask me, Randy, what one issue, one issue, would you most like to see fully repaired in the country today? Well, there are so many that vie for the top spot, but I would have to say that that issue just might be racism, hating people because they're different than me, because their skin tone is different than mine, because their land of origin is not the same as mine. Deep divisions and deep hatreds. Now, the reality is I don't have the political answers. I'll leave that to brighter and wiser minds than mine. But I do have an important, in fact, I would say an urgent question. And that is, what about the church? What does the church have to say? What does the church wish to do? It's a key question, especially in this series, seven plus one, seven ideas that could save the church and one more that could change the world. It's a key idea that we come to today, a searing question. Because the truth is, the church has often been more part of the problem than it has been the solution. All one has to do is to read our history as a Christian church. We have often done far more to contribute to the division and the hatred than we have to healing it. So what do we do? What does the church have to say? 
Well, with apologies to some of my dear friends, I'm going to go to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I say apologies to them because any time this topic arises, that's exactly where I go, to Ephesians. I just happen to think that Ephesians is the summit. It is the Mount Everest of writing when it comes to this issue of polarization, division, hatred, and racism. Because Paul wrote into a world that was fractured, that was ruptured, that was divided, much like we experience in America today. So I go to Ephesians. But before we read from Ephesians, we have to set a bit of the context about the world into which Paul was writing. Paul was writing into a world that wasn't divided so much as we are between black and white or between Asian and Hispanic. He was writing into a world that was divided between Jew and Gentile. I'd like to give you a flavor of what the situation was at the time. I want to read you a quote from a New Testament commentary, but before I read it, I want to ask you to remember this is speaking about ancient Judaism. Please don't put our friends, modern-day Jews, our friends, our brothers and sisters, don't put them into this category. This is ancient Judaism of 2,000 years ago. But listen to what Paul was writing into. The Jews had immense contempt for the Gentiles. They said that the Gentiles were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell and that God loved only Israel of all the nations that he had made. The best of serpents crush, they said. The best of Gentiles kill. It was not even lawful to give help to a Gentile woman in childbirth for fear that would be to bring another Gentile into the world. The barrier between Jews and Gentiles was absolute. If a Jew married a Gentile, the funeral of that Jew was carried out. Such contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. Even going into the house of a Gentile made a Jew unclean. You get a a bit of a feel for the hatred, the animosity that existed, right? Does it sound familiar? There may have been no place where that animosity, that racism, that bigotry was more evident than on the grounds of the temple. You see, that temple in Jerusalem was surrounded by different courts. Every time you moved closer to the temple itself, every time you transitioned out of one court and into another, the number of people allowed inside diminished. You had the temple itself, and then the court of the priests, the court of the Israelites, the court of the women, and then on the outside, you had the court of the Gentiles. There was a barrier, a wall that was built around the court of the Gentiles that had inscriptions on the wall stating that no Gentile could pass beyond that. In fact, archaeologists have uncovered some of those inscriptions. We have them in the writings of Josephus, but we also now have hard evidence writings on inscriptions that said things like, let every Gentile be on notice that if he passes beyond this barrier, the responsibility for his death will rest on him. We put up signs. We see signs around properties that say violators will be prosecuted. They had a sign that said violators will be killed. It was such an intense reality that the Romans themselves, themselves, Josephus tells us this, the Romans themselves had given to the Jewish people the right to execute people who passed beyond that boundary. Paul the Apostle was in prison. His imprisonment started with the fact that it was believed that he had brought a Jew inside of that enclave. It was a wall both literal and figurative. The words of one other New Testament commentary will underline just how deep the division was. In the ancient world, writes the late James Montgomery Boyce, in the ancient world, no wall, whether figurative, like our walls, or literal, like the wall in Jerusalem, was so impassable as the wall between Jew and Gentile. 
No wall gave greater occasion for scorn or arrogance. Profound division. Deadly division. Read the history of the early church and you'll get a sense as the Gentiles begin to come in for just how profoundly difficult this wall was to cross. This barrier in many ways was absolute. So if we're going to ask the question, how should the church in the contemporary world respond to racism? Maybe the earlier question we ought to ask is how did the church in that world respond to the same issue in their day and time? And it is for that reason that we go to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. A letter he writes into a church divided between Jew and Gentile. Both had come to Christ but they were deeply separated, polarized. What will Paul say to them? We're gonna read from Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11, but let me just give you a brief thumbnail of what we're going to read. We're going to read basically three different paragraphs. The first one, Paul will say something about the condition of the Gentiles outside of Christ. Secondly, he will say what Christ did at the cross for all of us. And thirdly, he will compel us to go out and live that way. So Ephesians 2, starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple to the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by His Spirit. To put it very simply, Paul tells us that the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility has been eradicated. It has been torn down. It has been abolished by Jesus at the cross. And Paul says, therefore, he made the two, Jew and Gentile, he made the two one new humanity. One new humanity. Now, that's an interesting word that Paul chooses, new humanity because there are two Greek words from which he could have chosen. The first Greek word for new is a word that describes something that is new at this point in time, but there have been many others like it before. For example, I understand that Apple is about to come out with a new iPhone. When that new iPhone is released, it will be a new iPhone, but there have been hundreds of millions of iPhones before this one. This one is new at this point in time. That's not the word Paul chose. The second word is something that is new in quality. There's never been anything like it before. It is new now for the first time. Like, like Alexander Graham Bell with that new contraption, the likes of which there had never been one before, called the telephone. This one is brand new. We haven't seen something like this before. That's the word Paul chooses. He says that 
at, at, at Calvary, Christ destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, and he took the warring factions, those who hated each other, and out of the two, he made one new humanity. That's why John Stott refers to Ephesians as, descript, as describing God's new society, God's new humanity. There's never been one like this before. John Chrysostom, that golden-throated preacher of the 4th century, said it like this. He said, it's as though God were to melt down lead and then melt down silver and then pour them both together. And out of that concoction would come glittering, gleaming gold. It makes no sense. It's brand new. But God does it. And that, says Paul, is what Jesus did that day, that fateful Friday at Calvary. He abolished the wall, tore down the wall figuratively. The wall of hostility that existed, of exclusion that was in place. And out of the two warring factions, he reconciled them and made them one. So that's what the church needs to say. In a world that is polarized, characterized by hatred, where racism is in evidence too many times, what does the church say? The church gives the news that we have already been reconciled. At the cross, Jesus reconciled us. That's the news. That's the news that we extend, that we offer, that we preach. There may be other solutions, some that can be very helpful, some not as much so. Other political solutions. But let us, as the church, say the solution is Calvary's cross. That instrument of destruction and death that was erected as humankind's attempt to say, we don't want any part of God, which God then redeemed, and it became the cross by which he said, I will reconcile you not only to myself, but I will reconcile even the most warring factions to each other. Seven ideas that could save the church. What is today's idea? It is simply this. We have already been reconciled. But there's a problem. I can almost hear you here in this church studio on the other side of that TV screen saying, Randy, please, seriously? Just drive around your town. You know what you'll see. You'll see on every hand, evidences not only of racism and bigotry, but you'll see those evidences even in the church. How then can you say, how then could Paul say, we were reconciled at the cross? Well, you have to understand Ephesians. You have to understand Ephesians as a letter. It comes in two parts. It's rather neatly divided. We don't often get that in Scripture, but this time we do. Neatly divided, chapters 1 to 3, instruction. Chapters 4 to 6, pardon me, identity. Chapters 4 to 6, instruction. Chapters 1 to 3, doctrine. Chapters 4 to 6, duty. And so in this section we have just read, Paul is speaking about the identity of the believer. You are in Christ, and in Christ you have been made one. But then in chapters 4 to 6, Paul will go on to talk about how we are to live as one. And so I want to take you to the opening three verses of chapter 4. They come right at the crease in the letter, right as Paul is making his transition from heavy theology to practical theology. He's now going to talk out, tease out, address the implications of the fact that our identity in Christ is that we are one in Him. What do we do with that? 
In these first three verses of chapter 4, as he makes that transition, he gives us two elements that we cannot forget if we are going to live out the reality that we are one. So listen to the words, Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So what's the first element of living out this reality of our identity in Christ? It's this. Live out your true identity. Live out your true identity. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Worthy. Interesting word in the original. It's a word that has roots in the marketplace. Worthy. Th think about it this way. You come up to a merchant in the Ephesian marketplace and you're wanting to buy five pounds of that corn over there. And the merchant says, five pounds? Yes, five pounds. And so he takes one of those old scales, those old balances, and on one side he places the five pound weight that he has and it tips dramatically in that direction. And then with his scoop, he stabs into the pile of corn and piles it on the other side of the scale so that slowly it now balances itself. When it is fully balanced, the corn is worthy. That's Paul's word. <clears throat> worthy of the weight on the other side because it has balanced. And that's what Paul says. He says, you have your identity. You are in Christ. You are one in Christ. And that has tipped the scales in this direction. That's the first half of Ephesians. Now he says, I want your lives, your actions, your deeds, your relationships, your church to make that scale balance. Live a life worthy of your identity. In other words, the first element that Paul wants us to face is that we have to live out our true identity. You know what your true identity is if you have been to Calvary? Your true identity is that you are in Christ. You are in Christ. First and foremost, that is your identity before any other element of your identity in Christ. Your first and foremost identity is not that you are white, that you are black, that you are Asian, that you are Hispanic. All of those are important. They're woven into the fabric of who you are. None should denigrate any because of that. But Paul's point is, that's not your first and foremost identity. Your first and foremost identity is you are in Christ. Remember last week, our deepest loyalty is Jesus. In Christ. Live out your true identity. That is what Paul was calling the early church to live. It's captured in the words of the Christian writer Philip Yancey. Listen to what Yancey writes. As I read accounts of the New Testament church, no characteristic stands out more sharply than its diversity. Beginning with Pentecost, the Christian church dismantled the barriers of gender, race, and social class that had marked Jewish congregations. Paul, who as a rabbi had given thanks daily that he was not born a woman, a slave, or a Gentile, marveled over the radical change. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One modern Indian pastor told me, most of what happens in Christian churches, including even miracles, can be duplicated in Hindu and Muslim congregations, 
but in my area only Christians strive, however ineptly, to mix men and women of different castes, races, and social group. That's the miracle, the real miracle. Diversity complicates rather than simplifies life. Perhaps for this reason we tend to surround ourselves with people of similar age, economic class, and opinion. Church offers a place where infants and grandparents, unemployed and executives, immigrants and blue bloods can come together. Just yesterday, I sat sandwiched between an elderly man hooked up to a puffing oxygen tank and a breastfeeding baby who grunted loudly and contentedly through the sermon. Where else can we find that mixture? When I walk into a new church, the more its members resemble each other and resemble me, the more uncomfortable I feel. Yancey has captured the essence of what Paul is saying. The fact that people were Jewish didn't disappear. The fact that they were Gentile didn't diminish. But at Calvary, out of the two, God had created one new humanity, nothing like it ever before. He called it church, where the foremost identity is that you are in Christ. That's what's first. And so Paul begins at the transition of the letter by saying, live out your true identity. But there's a second element in those first three verses of chapter 4. Second piece of what Paul says, you caught it in verse 3. He starts that verse by saying, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every every effort. It's strong language. Here's what Paul's saying. First element, live out your true identity. Second element, no matter how hard it is. Live out your true identity no matter how hard it is. And it will be hard. That's what Paul is saying. In fact, the whole rest of the letter, the second half of the letter, he delves into that, dealing with all the realities that tend to characterize our relationships. Anger and miscommunication and conflict and difficulty and lying and so many other things. He addresses them one after another. Because he knows that while we have been made one in Christ, living as one in Christ will never be easy. Therefore, he says, make every effort. Now, there are two pieces to that. Two pieces to that verse. We can't miss them. One, it's going to take work, hard work, persevering work, persevering effort. And two, what we're working on is not creating peace. That was created at Calvary. Paul says make every effort to keep the unity of the peace. Keep it, not create it. Jesus already created, created it. We have already been reconciled. Now through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our community, we must expend every effort Spare no energy to keep that peace. And make no mistake, it is hard. You've found that, haven't you? If we all have the same political opinions, if we all speak the same language, if we all went through the same schools, if we all look alike, it's a whole lot easier. But when political opinions differ, when backgrounds are diverse, when the way we look isn't the same, it becomes very hard. Even if we know we are one. And that's why Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. I'll give you just one example of the challenges that exist with such. This comes from the pen of Ed Gilbreth. Ed Gilbreth was, was a, an employee at Christianity Today for many years, editor, writer, church leader. In this particular piece written some years ago in Christianity Today, he, he writes about 
a friend of his. He gives him the name Daryl Davis. That's not his real name. These are Davis's words that Gilbreth pens. He writes, It was my third year with the ministry. He was an African-American pastor. It was my third year. I got a call from a prominent white Christian leader asking me to go to lunch with him. As we're sitting down to eat, all of a sudden this guy starts crying. He explained that God had blessed him. His children were healthy. He was known throughout the country. But he said, I've had a hard time sleeping throughout the night. And I was thinking to myself, why is he telling me this? I'm not a therapist. I just came back from an annual conference on the other side of the country, the man told me. A bunch of us got together to discuss reconciliation and cross-cultural ministry. Usually, when black leaders come into the meeting, we make them feel right at home and let them be part of the decision-making process. But to be honest with you, the man told Davis, the decisions are made before your leaders ever get there. I'm used to hearing the jokes and the use of the N-word. But this time, when the jokes were going on and people were saying things, it didn't sound right to me. How can I get over this, the leader asked me, sobbing. How can we be friends? I was silent for a moment, then asked him, Do you like football? He seemed a little puzzled, but said, Yes. I do too, I told him. I used to coach high school and college ball, and I have a lot of friends who play pro. I love a good game and love to cook out. So here's what we do. I need to get to know you, and you need to get to know me. Why don't you come to my house? I was the only black in my suburban neighborhood at the time. I said, bring your wife and meet my wife, and we'll just sit and talk and get to know each other. I'll bar bar barbecue some steaks and... And let's start there. He was taken aback. He said, you want me to come to your house? Yes, I said. If you want me to sit here and clear your conscience for all the crap you did, I can't do that. Friendship is not cheap. It takes time and commitment. I gave him my phone number and told him to give me a call. I never heard from him again. It's not easy. So Paul says, make every effort. Don't leave any energy unspent. Don't leave any effort untried. Don't leave any opportunity undone. Make every effort. Live out your true identity no matter how hard it is. So maybe we need to ask ourselves some questions. Those of us who belong to Christ, those of us who say, I've been to Calvary. If we've been to Calvary, we are in Christ. He has reconciled us. We are one. Maybe we need to ask ourselves some questions, though, about living out our true identity. For example, this African-American leader said, come and eat at my house. The late Fred Craddock, the late great Fred Craddock, in my estimation, the late Fred Craddock said this, tell me who sits at your table, and I'll tell you who you are. It's not a bad place to begin. To make certain that when we sit around our table, when we open our door, when we express hospitality, to make certain that not everybody looks like me, thinks like me, believes like me. To live out my true identity no matter how hard it is. And so we live in a polarized world, struggling to find ways forward, 
struggling often through external motivators, external laws to try to bring about unity. And in the midst of it all is the church, the church that has too often been more part of the problem than part of the solution. What can we say? Well, maybe what we say is that we join Paul. We first spend time at Calvary. And then we say, there at Calvary, the wall was torn down. The hostility was abolished. We have a new identity. We are one. Let's live out our true identity, no matter how hard it is. Because we have already been reconciled.
gracious God. It certainly doesn't feel like we've been reconciled. But we accept it by faith in the Jesus of Calvary. And now would you, by the power of your infilling and indwelling Spirit, propel us out of our comfort zones to live out our true identity, no matter how hard it is. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Hello, everybody. So glad to be back with you. Lots of questions this past week, but there is one thing about which there is no question, and that's who our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is, always the same, faithful to us every single day. So I'm grateful for that and grateful to be able to greet all of you for birthdays and anniversaries today. Top of my list, hello, Leslie Lewis, Charlotte, North Carolina. So glad to be reminded of your birthday, Leslie, and blessings to you on your ministry there in North Carolina Conference. Hello, Lillian Casebolt Christian, La Center, Washington, 92nd birthday, lady, and there you are with your handsome husband. Congratulations. Hello, Julie Ballman, Des Moines, Iowa. So glad you folks are a part of our Loma Linda family. Your 60th birthday, Julie, and there you are with husband Richard. Sonia DeLang, always glad to be where you are, Sonia, to see you, to hear you a part of the singers and strummers, and always glad to see you with dear Mark. Congratulations on your birthday, Sonia. And look at this man, Reagan Caligus, up San Francisco way, 15 years old, and I can tell he's into sports, at least golf, and if I'm not mistaken, that's at a 49ers game. Winifred Winnie Kim, right here at the villa. Hello, Winnie. Always glad to know about family birthdays there at the villa. And congratulations to you on your birthday, Winnie. Hello, Dorothy Zane. Bless your heart. I'm so glad to see you every time I can and to be in touch with you. And now for your birthday, Dorothy, and to see you there with dear, dear Ernie and your beautiful family. Hello, Katharina Bishop Thomas, Rio Claro, Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, having a birthday. Congratulations, lady, and so glad to be reminded of your special days. Donna Hadley, I don't know that you look any more beautiful than you do when holding a new baby. Congratulations, Donna, and on your birthday, and there with dear Roger. Glad to be a part of your family and you a part of our family. Hello, Patty Mitchell. So wish we could be in touch again. But this way, we're reminded of your birthday, Patty, and I wish you all the very, very best. Hello, Deanna Glenmire, right here, part of University Church family, and there you are with dear Heidi. Congratulations on your birthday, Deanna. Jamie Stadola, always glad to be where you are and to hear your teaching. Glad you've been a part of University Church here for a while, and now to say happy birthday, Jamie. Gary Parks, up Salem, Oregon Way. So glad to be reminded of your birthday, Gary, and wow, we go back a ways, don't we? But congratulations on your birthday. Henry Friesen, also a part of the Villa family. Hello, Henry. Glad to know about your 91st birthday. Warmest congratulations. Marilyn Herman, I'm always glad to be where you and Cliff are. Thank you so much for all you do for University Church and wish we could see you, but happy birthday nonetheless. Phil Binkley, bless your heart. You are Mr. Music, Low Melinda Academy for sure. I understand you came to this community 44 years ago and started influencing the music program at the schools. And now I get to say happy birthday. I think you're 81st. Phil, as I see you there with your newest granddaughter, Paige. Hi, Bruce Cooley. I always enjoyed getting to see you here at University Church, but now I get to see you in a picture and with your wife. Congratulations on your birthday, Bruce. Elaine Barnes, right here, Loma Linda Assisted Living, marking your 96th birthday. Warmest congratulations, Elaine. Eddie No. So glad to be in touch with you too, Eddie. Know about your birthday. And there you are with your beautiful wife and your granddaughter, Paige. Hi, Pauline Park. Always glad to be where you are. And days past, we used to meet 
in your mother-in-law's room. But now I get to learn about your birthday, Pauline, and I wish you all the best. Hal Thompson, wow, do we go back a ways and always glad to see you when we could be together in church here and other times now as well. But I'm glad to know about your birthday, Halvard. And there you are with Judy. And the thing you two do best is take care of grandchildren also. Hi, Cliff Walters. Man, we miss you here at Loma Linda. But I'm so glad to know it's your birthday. And I'm wishing you the very best as I see you there with Carmen in some important place. But particularly Captain Cliff on your own vessel out there at Oxnard. Hi, Phil Draper. So glad to know about your birthday. And I'm here to wish you all the very best. And that goes for all the rest of you folks. And I look forward to being with you next Sabbath, Lord willing. Happy, happy greetings.